morning, and thank you for joining with us on this Lord's Day. Uh, we want you to know that we will be resuming services here at the church very soon, and to that end, you will be receiving a survey letter shortly. We ask you to let us know if you will be attending these first services with us, if for any reason you feel uncomfortable in returning to the services at this time, we want you to know that the services will continue to be posted online. With that, I ask you to bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given for this opportunity to gather together in your word. We ask you to open our minds and hearts to receive what you have for us through the music, through the word, and we pray your blessings upon us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, as we look to the word this morning, I'll ask you to bow with me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask now, as we prepare to look into your word, that you would help us to allow your spirit to be our teacher, to give us insight and understanding. And also, Father, to help us to apply the things that we see this morning to our own lives, to know of a certainty who we are in Christ Jesus and to understand the importance of him as our cornerstone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As Peter drew chapter 1 to an end, he noticed that we were born again by the word of God which was preached to us. Now, as he begins chapter 2, he looks to the word again, writing in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, 
Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Laying aside is the Greek word apatithemi, and Paul uses the same word over in Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, writing, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Meaning to put away from, to set aside. Apatithemy is also translated as renounce. The lists differ somewhat in their content, but not in their character. They're all things that are common to our old life before Christ. And for Paul, they are to be put off or removed like old garments. And for Peter, they are to be laid aside or discarded. Peter employs a slightly different image next. Whereas Paul tells us to put off the old and put on the new, in place of putting on the new man, Peter uses the image of of desiring or craving that a newborn has for his mother's milk. Paul stresses the importance of maturing beyond milk to meat. This is his presentation of growing up in Christ. Peter, on the other hand, encourages us to continue with that fervent desire for the pure or the genuine word as an infant constantly hungers for his mother's milk. Again, through this milk, we are nourished and we grow. And every parent knows that once an infant begins nursing, nothing else will satisfy. They're hungry every two hours. They have no desire for a binky or a formula. No substitutes are accepted. And it's normal for babies to require milk so that they will grow. And herein, Peter extends this imagery of milk with this supposition. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. This is the Greek word krestos. And krestos literally means sufficient, satisfying, or beneficial. As the newborn babe has tasted the milk and realized that it is good, so we have tasted the Lord and understood that he is sufficient, that he is satisfying that he is beneficial to us. Again, having utilized a normal or natural example, Peter offers the normal response that is to be expected. But in a spiritual context, if we are born of the word and nurtured by the word, our natural response should be to desire the word continuously once we have tasted it and realized that it is beneficial to us. And having established the necessity of feeding on the word to grow, Peter now shifts to a different analogy that is based on Christ as the cornerstone. I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, in order that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Christ is the living stone to whom we come, the chief cornerstone of Zion here in verse 6. This is the foundation stone of the entire building, and every stone must be aligned perfectly to this stone. This is an ancient image, not just of architecture, but also in messianic prophecy. It is taken from Isaiah 28 and from Psalm 118. In Isaiah 28, the precious cornerstone is a sure foundation, but in context, it becomes a standard by which the evil are condemned because they do not align with the cornerstone. In Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected speaks of the salvation of the Lord to all those who rest upon him. Yet they are the same stone, and salvation or judgment is dependent upon the individual, whether they receive the cornerstone or reject the cornerstone. Now, Peter employs both of these passages in his sermon in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, when he was condemned by the elders and the family of the high priest. To set the stage for us, he had come upon an individual who was lame from birth, and as having come upon him, he then healed him. But having healed him, he then proclaimed Christ, crucified, risen again. We read in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If this day we are judged by a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now in this passage in Acts, we see the two groups represented in Isaiah and Psalms. One group rejects the cornerstone, who is Christ. The other group embraces him and is then built upon him. And those who come to Christ become living stones, as they are now bonded to the chief cornerstone. They are built up to become a spiritual house, the temple of God, if you will. I'm turning to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, where Paul writes, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, rose into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now we are sojourners in this world. But in Christ, we are fellow citizens and members of the household of God. We are both individually and corporately a dwelling place of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And herein we see why we are to be holy, for he is holy. The tabernacle and the temple were holy places, places of worship. And those who entered there were to be purified before entering. Only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, which is where the presence of God was manifested above the Ark of the Covenant. We, in like manner, are to be sanctified if we are to minister 
before the Lord. Herein Peter declares that we are, as these living stones, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable God. Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 12, where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a holy sacrifice unto him. And it's here that we look back to Peter's admonition to be holy in all your conduct as part of our calling to this position. And herein we're set apart, much like the priests of the Old Testament. Thus Peter also speaks to our ministry in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, writing, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God. I would remind us here that all of these titles, as marvelous as they are, are only ours because we have come to the chief cornerstone and been received by God's marvelous grace. Herein, the Jew and Gentile have become the people of God. We have been reconciled first to God and then to each other through Christ to proclaim the praises of God. This is our calling to ministry. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth because we have come to the cornerstone. We have accepted him as God the Son. But not all have come to Christ. And we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. We read the following. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Again, the chief cornerstone is Christ, but he is also a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who, in the words of Peter, are disobedient. This is the Greek word apatheo, which means to be disobedient in the sense of refusing to believe, refusing to be persuaded, refusing to yield to God's call. It is a very significant word in that it depicts willful and stubborn disobedience, even to the point of rebellion. And herein we see the disobedient ones come upon the same cornerstone. But rather than receiving him as Lord, they reject him. This is the Greek word apodakamazo, which literally means to carefully examine and to judge someone or something as not being worthy as not being genuine, and thus something to be rejected as unfit. These were the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priests, the religious leaders of Israel who saw Christ's work. They heard his teaching. They knew the scriptures, and yet they rejected him as their Messiah. They were the builders who rejected the perfect cornerstone thereby making Christ their stumbling block and a rock of offense. In rejecting Christ, they made him a lithos aproskopos, a stone upon which one steps and loses his balance or strikes his foot and stumbles. The lithos is a small stone, but it can still cause us to stumble. But therein, Christ also becomes the Petra Scandalou. Now, Petra is a Greek word for a great mass of rock, for an immovable and 
great stone, the foundation stone, if you will. And as such, Christ becomes the scandalon, the trigger that trips the snare and causes the unbeliever to fall upon the rock. These two images of a stumbling stone and a rock of offense or destruction are different in appearance, but they are to be taken together as the cause for destruction. One cannot ignore Christ. We will either accept him or will stumble upon him, losing our balance and fall. We will receive him or we will ignore him. But he demands that we do one or the other. I'm reminded of Matthew 16, 13 through 17, where Jesus himself put forth the question of his true identity. When Jesus came into the regions of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Who do men say that I am? Well, there are those who called him blasphemer. They called him a sinner. They condemned him because he ate with sinners. They rejected him completely as the Messiah. To receive Christ for who he is, as God the Son, is to make him our cornerstone. But to reject him as the Messiah makes him the cause for our destruction. We read in John chapter 13, verse 18, He who believes in him, that is Christ, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The issue here is whether or not a man has believed or not believed. Herein we see the significance of this latter part of 1 Peter 1.8, where Peter writes, they stumble being disobedient to the word, stubbornly rejecting the word to which they also were appointed. And herein we see that the choice that one makes determines the consequences he faces for eternity. God has appointed all who believe to eternal life. God has appointed all who do not believe to damnation. He has not appointed one to believe and the other to not believe, but he has appointed every believer to salvation and every unbeliever to judgment. Herein we return to our original text, and I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and his final exhortation. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts which were against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. We see Peter actually returning to his initial exhortation in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, to lay aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and evil, evil speaking, as he urges us to abstain now from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. And while he does so primarily for the sake of our own souls, for the sake of our testimony for Christ, he also does so for the good of those around us. And here I'm reminded of the words of Christ in John 15, 18 and 19. Where Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore 
the world hates you. And here I remind us, we are the sojourners. We are the outsiders while we are here in this world. Our beliefs are not accepted. Our beliefs and the way that we live are not understood by those who are around us. In that context, people tell, Peter tells us that we should expect the world to speak against us as evildoers and to persecute us because they reject the one in whom we believe and the life that we live for him. It is all the more reason, however, for us to live honorably among them. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 21, verses 12 and 13, But before all these things, they will lay their hand on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. They may condemn our faith. They may mock how we live for our faith in this world. But even that is an opportunity for us to be witnesses for Christ. First of all, through our words as we speak of him, but then also through our deeds as we live for him. They may reject our words and our deeds, but they have not any excuse because they have seen what Christ has called us to. Christ tells us in Matthew 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now in this world, in this life, do not expect to be justified. Understand that the very gospel that we have believed is an offense to the world. Christ, whom we love and have accepted as Lord and Savior, is rejected as the whole. Oh, they may not all call him a sinner or a blasphemer, but neither is he merely one of the prophets. He is God the Son. He is the one and only cornerstone, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We will be justified perhaps not in this world, but one day when all men stand before God. And I'm turning to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, where John the Beloved writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. <clears throat> and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now remember, Peter has declared to us that God is holy and that he judges without partiality on the basis of each man's works. Our faithfulness will be rewarded because we have trusted in Christ. We have put our faith wholly and entirely in him and through the saving grace that is ours through faith. Their disobedience to the word, their rejection of the word will in fact be their cause of judgment. For those who have received Christ, there is only one book about which we need to be concerned. And that is the book of life into which each of our names was written when we receive Christ as Savior and Lord. But for those who have rejected Christ, those who will stand upon their own lives, who have deemed the cornerstone unfit and unacceptable, there remain only the books of works. All that has been said and done and thought throughout an entire life 
and they will be judged by that. We will be judged by Christ. When he looks at us, God will see the blood of his son, and he will know that the debt has been paid. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us, that we may lay aside all those things of the old life, that we may truly desire the sincere milk of the word like a newborn babe. We pray, Father, that we would come to your word, learn your word, grow in your word, and share your word as witnesses of Christ. That is our calling here in this world. And whatever the results may be, we will know, Father, that we have done your will. And we'll thank you, Father, for what you accomplish through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.